Improving Alpha, Innovation and Investing, ESG and Technology with Michael Oliver Weinberg is being sponsored by Alternatives Watch and powered by Vidrio Financial. For a 360 degree view of investor mandate activity across alternative investments, turn to Alternatives Watch. Vidrio Financial is the first technology enabled service for allocators looking to harness investment complexity and make better allocation decisions. Learn more at vidrio.com. That is V I D R I O.com. Hi, this is Michael Oliver Weinberg. We would like to welcome everyone to the Improving Alpha Innovation in Investing, ESG, and Technology podcast series. Today, Russ Carson, chairman of the Carson Family Charitable Trust, will join us. That said, Russ has quite a few of the most impressive affiliations. Uh, though they're, they're far too numerous for me to list, but um, they're, they're remarkable. Uh, in any case, we'll discuss some highlights in the philanthropy segment of this podcast. Uh, so listeners have a high-level sense of our roadmap for today. We'll start with some background, then discuss investing, ESG, technology, and philanthropy. Investors and business leaders should be able to extract a great deal of value from Russ's insight. On that note, welcome, Russ. Thank you, Michael. Let's start briefly with your career and, and how it evolved to you know, where, where you are today. Uh, my career was a very lucky accident. Uh, I graduated from Columbia Business School in 1967. I took a job with Citibank, uh, thinking that I was going to be a commercial banker. Uh, I happened to join the bank in November of 1967, uh, when the bank was just in the process of setting up its, its first venture capital vehicle. Uh, so I was put into the strategic planning department to basically be a gopher to uh, coordinate the lawyers and, and the government and, and get the bank a, a license to operate, which it needed. Uh, I wound up doing that for two months. And then uh, senior management said, well, you've been doing this for two months, so you know more about venture capital than the person we're going to put in to run it. So why don't you work for him for two months and tell him everything you know, and then you can be a commercial banker. And I wound up never being a commercial banker. I spent my entire career uh, in venture capital and private equity. Uh, Citicorp Venture Capital started in 1968 with five million dollars of capital. Uh, it, it made a bunch of small investments in a variety of different kinds of companies. Uh, it long term, it worked out extremely well. Uh, but I had the great experience of really starting a venture capital firm from scratch. Uh, that led in 1978 to my making the decision to join two other people uh, and, and form a firm that today is called Welch, Carson, Anderson & Stowe, which again started as venture capital business. Uh, we raised $33 million in 1979, uh, which at the time was the second largest uh, fund that had been raised by a uh, an unaffiliated group of individuals. Uh, the firm today has grown to, uh, uh, it now has raised 18 partnerships. Uh, it's got $31 billion, billion of capital under management and uh, has become one of the leaders in investing in the uh, healthcare and information technology industries. Uh, so my, my entire career has been on the private investing side, which again is a total contrast to what I thought I was going to be doing when I got out of business school and joined Citicorp. Interesting. Um, and and uh, so you've really seen the acceleration in venture and tech over the, the past decades, uh, but probably go from a cottage industry to a behemoth today, right? Uh, when, we, when we started Citicorp Venture Capital, the, the bank put $5 million in, which was the original capital, which made them one of the largest players in the industry. At the time, there couldn't have been more than 20 other venture capital firms in the United mm -hmm. States. There was no uh, private equity industry. Uh, when we started WCIS, we raised $33 million in a, in a year where the entire industry raised uh, probably not much more than, than $100 or $200 million. Uh, that industry today is, has got 7,000 participants in it that uh, collectively manage $17 trillion of capital, which is the last number I saw. So uh, this has just been an enormous sea change over the last 50 years in terms of the size of the industry and its impact on, on the American economy and the global economy. 
Yeah, it reminds me of I, I, I was a portfolio manager at Soros for, for George Scott and Stan in the late 90s. And the hedge fund industry has, you know, had a similar evolution from a sort of niche family office driven industry to an institutional industry with trillions. Um, do you think? Oh, sorry. Do you think I, I was going to say with, with yeah, a lot please. of the same issues that uh, as these industries get bigger, they become more commoditized. It gets harder to get your returns because you're no longer unique. You're. Uh, you're, you're one of a number of people that are, are peddling capital and peddling abilities and uh, to the same group of, of companies, either at the startup phase or uh, at the buyout phase. Do you, so to that extent, uh, this is a slight uh, digression, but that's OK. Uh, do you think um, the venture and or private equity are overcapitalized or? I, I don't think either industry is overcapitalized. What I what I do tell my successors at, at Welch Carson is uh the industry is now large enough that it is in the government. Uh, uh, it, it's in the realm of government acknowledgement and be careful what you wish for. Uh, the government is going to look at this industry harder and harder. Uh, it will try and regulate the industry in ways that we can't imagine today. And I think you want to be very careful that you're, you you can make an argument that you're providing a, a productive service to society if all you're doing is is making money, particularly in the buyout businesses, if all you're doing is buying and flipping companies, there isn't a lot of societal value to that. So you got to have a strong argument that there's a value added to what you're doing. Yeah, that's sensible. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, well, let's let's start with the Carson Family Trust. Um, uh, Carson Family Charitable Trust, I should say. Um, you know, what's the objective of your fund? Of, of that uh, I started the fund, uh, I, uh, the charitable trust in, in uh, 1991, and it was really a vehicle to bring my kids to the dining table. I, I have a son and a daughter and uh, same wife I've had for 53 years now. Uh, it was to get all of us to the dining room table to talk about our philanthropy and talk about not only why philanthropy was important, but about what we were doing, what our family values were. Uh, and and how we would go about uh, investing in various parts of society that were important to us. Um, as I went through time, it became my estate planning vehicle. Uh, my estate is set up so that uh, when my wife and I are gone, all of our wealth goes into the foundation. Uh, and the foundation is set up uh, very deliberately with a sunset date of uh, uh, the end of the year 2050, so basically, all of the wealth that I've been able to create over the years has to be given away by the year 2050, uh, which I find is a, a, a very good constraint. Uh, and and it, it actually enables me to better choose how much money I should be giving away. The constant question is, how do you give enough money away to get to zero by the year 2050? What's the right amount to give away? Uh, I find that a very useful guideline that I, I look at on a fairly regular basis of uh, given the investments I'm making, what sort of return can I expect? And what does that mean in terms of how much I should be giving away today to to get to zero at the end of 2050? Uh, so our, our foundation is a, it's a family foundation. Uh, we consciously made the decision not to have outside trustees. Our focus is the communities where we live, which is principally New York City. Uh, so 90% of our philanthropy is New York City based. Uh, we have enough money that we invest uh, in a number of different sectors, but uh, education, uh, healthcare, medical science, uh, uh, social services is a big area of interest to us uh, in culture. And uh, again, I think it's been very useful and, and given my investment experience, it's very useful to have a, a roadmap as to what it is you want to be investing in and, and where you want your money to be going. And also recognize that over time, the objectives of the foundation may change depending on uh, what anybody in our family's interest may be at, at the moment. That's uh, really admirable. It's it's fabulous. Um, let's talk about medical sciences, because you and I had the privilege and pleasure of being together at Columbia Business School a few, few weeks ago with Dean Glenn Hubbard and uh, uh, and I believe you, you chaired a, a, a chair that he sits in. Um, let's let's talk about medical sciences because you had some pretty interesting yes. thoughts and I, I think you've been involved in that space for some time and, and Welsh and, and your, your firm has been in, your, your prior firm has been in, involved in that. Yeah, the, the firm itself is, is specialized in medical services. So we, we've been probably the largest aggregator of uh, various parts of the, the, the healthcare delivery uh, system. 
Uh, my interest in medical science goes back more than 30 years ago when I was asked to join the board at Rockefeller University. Uh, for those of you listeners who don't know anything about Rockefeller University, it is the world's foremost biomedical research institution. Uh, it was formed by John D. Rockefeller uh, back in 1901 uh, with the objective of bringing together the best and the brightest in the world, putting them in one place and delegating to them the the, the job of uh, solving mankind's largest mysteries and, and uh, surrounding disease. Uh, so it's a very, very unique institution. Uh, I, I served on the board for more than 30 years. I'm, I'm still an emeritus trustee. I was chairman of the board for 13 years. Uh, so obviously that uh, became very much of interest to me. It's, it's our largest single philanthropic grantee. Uh, and, and there are the basic ideas that you're, you're financing basic research that can effectively enhance the human condition and en enable diseases like cancer that today uh, often have a bad outcome. Uh, the objective is obviously to figure out how do we make cancer a manageable disease or how do we eradicate cancer uh, over the period of the next 50 years, 100 years. And uh, again, I, I think one of the best ways of attacking problems like that is you need to bring very bright people together and you need to give them the funding and the independence to enable them to pursue any avenue of exploration that they, they'd like to pursue. So uh, that's been very much of interest to me. I, I also co-chair the New York Genome Center, which I, I helped create. Uh, genomics is the next great medical, medical technology. Right now, it's still basically a research technology. What one human genome has three billion pairs of information in it, so no human mind can possibly understand what all this means. But increasingly, particularly with artificial intelligence, increasingly machines can help us understand how do we take all that data and get something meaningful out of it. Uh, so I, I've been very active in that area. And I'm particularly interested in the, in the next 20 years, it will transition from a basic science uh, into a practical medical science that, that'll be in the clinical setting where we can use, uh, we can sequence your, your human genome and figure out exactly that what that means for your health status. And to, to some degree, we can predict what your future problems may be. And if necessary, we can intervene and solve the problem before it occurs. So yeah. it's, it's an extraordinary technology. And uh, I think all of us... Uh, I, I won't be here to see all of the benefit from it, but uh, I think future generations will clearly benefit from it in terms of improved health status. I, it's, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more in terms of um, when you have that kind of information now with, right, with, 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 you know, whether it's NVIDIA GPUs and cloud computing and AI machine learning finally working. And when you have that kind of data, yeah, I mean, that's something that the, the, this confluence of machine learning, data science, um, you know, record low processing and storage costs are, are ideal to to uh, to to solve that. And, and the change is extraordinary. Uh, when we started the New York Genome Center ten years ago, it cost us ten thousand dollars to sequence a, a, a single human genome. Today, we can do it for five hundred dollars. Yeah, exactly. It's parallel to um. It, there's there's a similar sort of parallel statistic. I think a million dollars of computing power in 1980 costs like four cents today. Some same concept. Yeah. The exponential. Moore, Moore's law was the big the big thing in the semiconductor industry, and this is Moore's law in the uh, in the biology area. That's great. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, um. Okay, well, that's that's inter that's super interesting. What about on the tech side? Anything you're doing on the other than sorry, other than like the, the genome or med 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 tech? Well, sort on, of. on the tech side, uh, we, we we always have been focused on the service side of the tech business. So uh, rather than investing in the uh, the high tech equipment or machinery side, where that that can be a, a a, a black and white business where you're, you're either successful and you make a lot of bit, uh, money or you lose all your money uh, for a variety of different reasons. We focus much more on the services side. Uh, my partner, Bruce Anderson, had been the acquisitions guy for uh, ADP uh, prior to, to our forming Waltz Carson Anderson. So Bruce acquired 300 local payroll companies over the course of the 10 years he was at ADP and built a multi-billion dollar uh, business out of a series of local acquisitions. Our strategy at Welch Carson has principally been an acquisition or acquisition slash consolidation strategy of 
finding an interesting area, buying a platform company in it, uh, and then making a series of acquisitions that create a much larger business out of a series of smaller parts. Uh, we've been able to apply that in both the uh, the healthcare and the information technology space. And uh, the strategy has obviously worked out very well over the years. Yeah. Um, what about, let's, let's shift gears for a second to ESG, as that's one of the primary topics of this, this discussion. Sure. Um, and I know you, know you shared some of your thoughts on uh, companies being there for society. And um, let's talk about what we talked about a few weeks ago at Columbia. Um, maybe, maybe start with governance and, and, share, and stakeholder, r- stakeholders and stakeholder rights. I- I'll leave that sort of open-ended because I think you have some views. Yeah. Uh, one of the areas that I've become very interested in is, is uh, what, what is the responsibility um, of the governance institutions that govern our corporations? Uh, uh, what's the responsibility of a corporation beyond just maximizing bottom line value for its stakeholders? Uh, Milton Friedman said 50 years ago that the only responsibility of a corporation was to maximize profitability. Uh, I, I think he meant it in a much broader context than people may have taken it. But I, I firmly believe that unless you're making a positive contribution to society, you're not going to be ultimately successful. Society will only turn on you if you you can't prove that you're adding value to society. Uh, so that that leads to a whole bunch of discussions about okay, what do you have to do to be a responsible corporate citizen? And I would argue you, you've got to take into account the interests of your employees, uh, your customers, your suppliers, and the communities where you live. Uh, I grew up in Toledo, Ohio, which is a town of when I grew up it was about three hundred thousand people. Uh, We had five Fortune 500 companies in town, and every time the city needed something, one of the first places you went was to the big corporations who generally were very receptive to doing things for the community. Uh, Over the course of the years, I think all but one of those companies has either been acquired or has gone global and moved their, their corporate headquarters. So. Uh, the whole ability of the community to rely on the local corporations to take care of their needs basically evaporated. And uh, that, that had a significant effect on, on the town, uh, which isn't lost on me. And, and big companies, as they globalized, I think, viewed their community responsibility as much less than they, they did in the earlier days. Uh, but to me, again, you've got to be a responsible member of the community or the community is going to turn its back on you at some point. Yeah, I, I think that's very sensible, and um, I couldn't agree more. Um, what, what, and then in terms of, um, it, you know, looking at ESG some more, uh, uh, that's sort of under the, I guess, governance part. Um, what about the environmental part? What do you have views on net, net zero, carbon neutrality, global warming? Yeah, I, I, I think obviously the environment is something that we have to be very conscious of. Uh, it's a classic problem in that it's a long-term problem. It's not a tomorrow problem. It's not a next year problem. It's a next 50 year problem. Although we are beginning to see signs that it's going to get to be a bigger and bigger problem if we don't do something about it sooner rather than later. Uh, the kinds of companies that we invest in at, at Welch Carson Really, the environment is not a big issue. Uh, healthcare is not a big polluter. Uh, technology, information technology is not a big polluter. S- service companies are not the problem. O- obviously, they they are tenants and buildings that uh, need to have ESG policies. But generally, the, the ESG function is outside of the basic business. I'm, I'm the lead director for a company called Select Medical. That's a uh, $6 billion dollar uh, healthcare services provider, and we now every year have to compile an, an ESG report. And you realize how difficult it is to try and answer a question like, "Well, okay, you're in all these rental buildings. Uh, w- how much pollution is being created by those buildings?" You know, first of all, it's a very difficult question to answer, and secondly, you're not going to be able to do anything about it because you don't own the building; your your landlord does. Uh, so you have you, know, you have difficult issues like that. Uh, I do think uh, ESG is something that companies should be aware of. They should be aware of their own contributions to the problem and think about what, if anything, can they do to uh, uh, better the the environmental quality in the, the communities where they live. 
But it's it's a very big, very complicated issue that long term, I, I think the best answer to this is probably going to be new technology that we can't even envision today. I, I agree. Uh, you know, it, some of what you said reminds me of when I was chief investment officer of Protege Partners. Uh, I was there for part of the uh, the Buffett bet. You know that that we had made that sort of million dollar bet with Buffett that that hedge funds would outperform the S and P. And uh, it and and along the the administrator was uh, the the Long Foundation, which is a proponent of long term investing and long term thought. And uh, you know, th- there's. You know, it, what that reminds me of, right, and, and you mentioned that the environment is a long-term problem. And, for example, um, it's like if, if I think – so, again, this, it'll all tie together in a minute here. Uh, you know, when I was at APG, the Dutch pension, we were looking at, again, global warming and all this. And we are making decisions and investments or divestments based on the very long-term perspective. So, again, you might have short-term underperformance or – long period of underperformance, but in the long term, be right. So I'd, I'd be curious to hear, though, as long termism versus short termism applies to companies, you know, as a, as a venture capitalist, as a private equity investor, what your view is? I, I think there's an enormous difference between a, being a public market investor and being a, a venture capital or, or private equity investor. Um, you know, my own view uh, throughout my career was always 10 years was kind of a reasonable period of time that I'd look at. I, I love long-term relationships. Uh, the board I'm now, on now, the uh, the only corporate board, Select Medical Corporation, I've been on that board for 30 years. I love the continuity of relationship. Uh, uh, I love being able to deal with the same people and uh, deal with the same issues and be able to do things through time. I think venture capital and private equity are two fairly different businesses. Uh, Although a firm like Welch Carson combines the two disciplines, venture capital is really starting things. It's it's being the catalyst that gets something new off the ground. And typically the venture capitalist gets it off the ground and then either cashes out or turns it over to somebody else uh, uh, once it begins to, to mature. Uh, the buyout business is very different in that you're often buying something that's more mature. You're trying to add value to it over a period of time, and then you're looking to either take it public or, or sell it. Um, you know, I, I classify the time frame in, in private equity as probably a five-year time frame, whereas anybody in venture capital that doesn't have at least a 10-year time frame is probably not going to be successful at it, uh, just because you need to understand your your successes are going to take longer to uh, materialize. You know, you don't, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want, or if if you don't have a view. But I'm just curious because you know, there's been this really, I think, recent evolution within private equity towards continuation funds. And and what I'm what I'm understanding from colleagues, for example, at Morgan Lewis's um, the, the sort of the law firm, but they deal a lot of work in, in in private equity, is that most GPs are rolling over into the continuation fund, and most LPs aren't. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic, and I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are, if any. Yeah, you know, there's a there's a creative tension uh, in, in the private equity industry between the limited partners and the general partners. You know, I, I've always thought if you had a company that was growing very nicely, say 15 to 20 percent a year, why would you sell it? And the limited partner view is much more they're investing in a 10 year fund. Uh, they want cash flow to come out of their private equity investments. Uh, they, they want uh, the ability to prove to their superiors that, that they've made a, a successful investment. So there's a lot of pressure from the LPs to give them an exit within a, a reasonable time, period of time. And I think, you know, typically on individual investments, that would be anywhere from three to seven years. In, term of the, in terms of the funds, it's probably eight to 12 years, but they want all their money back in, in that period of time. Again, if you're a general partner and you have an, uh, an investment that's successful, you like the company, you're, you're involved in it, why wouldn't you want to stay involved in, in the business for the long term? Yeah, yeah, and and I mean, there's an argument that a colleague and, of mine. Yeah, there's also it, the tax the the tax aspect that that if you have to sell the company, you then have a big tax bill, whereas the longer you keep the company privately, you let it compound tax free. Yeah, and there's an argument I saw literally within the last week that you know this is a, this is that someone was making this is why you know for example Buffett and Berkshire have outperformed private equity because they're buying and owning forever rather than having these 10-year forced contrived fund cycles. 
Yeah, and again, it's the difference also with with public market investing, where your time frame is. My my good friend Jim Simons, who's mm-hmm. one of the kings of, of basically computerized investing. You know, Jim's average holding period may be a couple of seconds. Uh, whereas you say, if you're a venture capitalist, it's got to be at least ten years. I've had the privilege of being uh, knowing Jim as well. Uh, probably not as friendly with him as you are, but uh, and being invested with 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 his funds, including the uh, including Medallion, a couple times over my career. And um, I, I mean, arguably, I think he. I, I mean, I think Medallion's probably it, it, probably the best track record in the world, or at least sir, better than Warren Buffett's track record over a long period of time. In, incomparably, incomparably. But he, he's exceptional, and that fund's exceptional, and. Yeah, there's there is no number two there, but uh, and anyway, um, d- different different game, different uh, different different game. Um, where where do you think the best opportunity from an investment perspective is now? I I, I feel very strongly in today's market. I I love the early stage venture capital business. I I think the best opportunities today are investing at the very earliest stage of a company's development. You know, I, I think there are questions about the public market as to whether it's is it fairly valued today? Is it overvalued? I don't think there are many people who think the public market is undervalued today. Uh, in the private equity industry, again, the industry has gotten so big and there's so much capital around, uh, there just aren't any bargains left. It's it's increasingly impossible to find a bargain. Uh, so it's going to get harder to earn uh, superior returns in the private equity business. The, the early stage venture capital business is still the place where you, you can invest in something and Earn earn a hundred times your money on a single investment, uh, or more. I, I I couldn't agree more. And in my sense, and I mean, you you can correct me if I'm wrong or you disagree, but my sense is, you know, uh, so if, you know, we had the massive overvaluation, and I would argue both public and private technology yes. equities, right? And then and and then you, I, my sense is, over the last sort of year, year and a half, you know, you've had this washout in venture, early stage venture. Late stage venture, I'm not entirely sure. Like you still have Instacarts where, you know, they IPO at 75% down from the last round. But but early stage venture, I think, is largely washed out. Where I see the bubble now, though, is AI VC. That, I think, is overvalued, overhyped at the I, moment. I would, I would completely agree with that. Uh, and this is just human nature that, uh, you know, humans always get ahead of themselves that if something likes, looks good, uh, people can talk themselves into thinking, oh, it's not just good, it's great. And it right. can possibly go down. I mean, I, I, I remember when I was much younger, people used to say, never sell IBM. IBM is the world's greatest company. They were the, the pioneers in the computer industry. What could ever go wrong with IBM? Right, right. And all of a sudden, IBM got competitors who totally out. Along came Apple. And, you know, today more people know about Apple than know about IBM. Oh, and the and the market cap of of, of Apple and Microsoft and uh, and on and on it goes. Com- compare, it's incomparable. I mean, it, 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 there's it's exponentially different. I, I think it's another lesson in life that uh, everything changes over time, and that uh, particularly in the corporate world, it's very hard for companies as they get bigger to to keep their innovation, uh, which is why small companies can start today and, and have the opportunity to become big companies. You know, the ideas are things that big companies could have had. I, you know, uh, a simple thing like the automobile industry, where how in the world did Tesla come along and become the most valuable automobile company from scratch? And, you know, Detroit could have invented the electric car, but they didn't because that would involve changing the way that they they did their manufacturing. And it took an innovator like Elon Musk to come along and and basically force them to change. It, to your point, I couldn't agree more. We uh, some uh, in, in around 2016, I, I'd co-founded a firm called Move 37, and we focused exclusively on machine learning and alternative data. So, you know, we were quite early in observing this, and our view was the disruptors D- disruptors in any industry, particularly our concept was in financial, in, in investing, basically, that basically like, you know, sort of the old school Buffets of the worlds will be over time more increasingly replaced by the Jim Simons of the world because uh, they can do it faster, cheaper, more efficiently with machine learning and, and, and alternative data. And, you know, I was a portfolio manager after Columbia Business School at Soros. And, you know, how many stocks could I look at? A hundred stocks and how many data points per company? A hundred. But as you and I are talking, a, a computer can simultaneously look at billions of data points 
it nonstop um, and see connections and relationships and patterns that we couldn't possibly see. And investing is all about pattern recognition. So in my view, increasingly um, machine learning and alternative data and data science will be very disruptive to just, just as, for example, Tesla, which is obviously also using machine learning and modern manufacturing techniques and, alter, you know, all, et cetera, was disruptive to the auto industry. But I'll pause there. Yeah, and I'd say the same thing is true uh, in, in the investing world, that uh, the long-only manager, I think, is increasingly under pressure uh, by uh, index funds. Uh, my own personal belief is that an index fund, particularly for me as an individual, but I, I think also for institutions, an index fund is a very acceptable alternative to a, a long-only manager. Uh, I, I chaired the investment committee of one of New York's big institutions other than Rockefeller. And uh, over the last 10 years, uh, the long-only managers in their portfolio have actually slightly underperformed the S&P 500. And again, which causes you to ask the question, well, exactly what what fees are we paying these people and what value are we getting from them? And you know, my conclusion would be I just soon own an index fund, which I can sell tomorrow morning, as opposed to lock my money up with a long, long-term manager and pay fees that may not be justified by performance. I couldn't agree more. And then that's of course like uh that's of course Buffett's argument. And if you're if you can't outperform via alpha or don't have a security yeah. selection or edge, and 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 that would have been John Bogle's view, of course, also, who who uh I couldn't agree more. Yep. Um all right, well moving on. Um uh what what's what when when you're looking to invest or do a deal with someone, I guess what's a red flag for you? I, I think it's probably lack of focus. Uh, you know, I want I want to be doing business with people who are very focused, and the simpler the task that they're doing, and the more focused they are on that task, the better they're likely to do at it. Uh, uh, again, if you took it, if I were to invest in a, a private equity or a venture capital fund, I would prefer a specialist uh, as opposed to a generalist. Uh, the specialist, uh, and that's what we were at uh, at Welch Carson. We specialized in two industries. We knew those industries as well or better than any of our competitors, and that gave us a, a significant competitive advantage and a value added that a generalist couldn't produce. So I, I, I like I like focus. Uh, uh, in my foundation, we have a couple of uh, hedge fund in, in investments. But they're both with managers that are very focused, one on technology, the other on biotech, uh, where I want a manager who's just doing one thing, not not trying to be all things to all people. Again, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, what's a material mistake you've made investing and a lesson you've learned from it that, I, that might be interesting? You know, I, I, I think probably the biggest single mistake is just it took me a while to understand that leverage cuts both ways. Uh, in the private equity industry, leverage is wonderful. It magnifies your returns when it works. It also can create enormous issues for you uh, if things don't go quite the way that you had planned. And I, I, I think a lot of people in the private equity industry don't fully understand that. You, you have to be through at least one business cycle to, to fully understand what the downside of leverage is. And the downside of leverage can be very ugly. Uh, one of the really great companies that I was involved in that we we created at Welch Carson was a company called U.S. Oncology. We bought local oncology practices, started by buying one practice in Denver with three oncologists in it, ultimately grew it to a $2 billion uh, publicly traded company. And our one mistake was that we, uh, we had taken it public. We then took it private again uh, for the second time and then uh, took it public. And we left too much leverage on the balance sheet. Uh, the government changed the reimbursement rules for uh, oncology pharmaceuticals. And all of a sudden, the economics of the business changed and we had too much leverage. Uh, we wound up selling the business correctly, but um, uh, at, at a good price. But, you know, to me, it was a lost opportunity that we had created a problem for ourselves that we hadn't anticipated. On, on the public company, the uh, board that I'm currently on, 
you know, I'm, I'm constantly asking management the question of what's the appropriate amount of leverage for our business. And let's make sure we don't put our business at risk when we go through the next cycle or if something changes on the regulatory front. You know, so you're, you're, I love the answer on leverage because to me, it's extraordinarily topical now. And I'm going to give you, and, and, and I, so my question for you is this, I've been looking, I've been spending a lot of time with some private equity firms lately, as well as some distressed credit firms. And I see this bizarre disconnect where the distressed credit firms are all saying, and the stressed credit firms are all saying, it's a great time because all these sponsor backed deals and levered firms, you know, SOFR has gone from sort of zero to one to 5% up sort of four or 5% in a year. And they have, you know, they may be good companies, but bad capital structures are over levered and their cash flow is being consumed by leverage. And therefore they either do or will need to restructure. Then simultaneously, I speak to the private equity firms. And they all say, ah, not a problem. We're fine. No issues. I don't know if you have a view on that. Yeah, I, I I think they we have not seen the bottom of this cycle yet. And it, it's going to be ugly uh, as it always is, uh, but but people are going to find it's it's not just the leverage; it's the change in interest rates, uh, some of which has been so far camouflaged by people that have been able to hedge their interest rates for for a year or two, but all of a sudden as uh, as the hedges run out, you're, you're going to find your interest expenses increase dramatically, and. Uh, uh, one of the things I worry about in, in both the venture industry and the private equity industry is making sure you have enough dry powder so that uh, if if your leverage does become too big or in the case of private equity, if you uh, in the case of uh, venture capital, if you're if your cash burn uh, says you're going to run out of money soon, make sure you have enough capital to protect yourself that you can you can put more capital into uh, the company if necessary to either fix a, a bad capital structure or to support the cash burn for a longer period of time. Yeah. Do you, do you, this, 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 this is sort of tied into uh, rates and um, in inflation. Um, I, I don't know if you have a view or, or, or if there's any way you're addressing it and you don't have to, if, if you don't. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think clearly we're in an environment where we're going to have higher interest rates for a period of time. I don't think inflation has gone away, and yet you still have people thinking that businesses should be valued at the same multiples that they were valued at when uh, when we went through basically this the speculative bubble we were in two years ago. Uh, another one of my pet peeves is uh, in, in the private equity industry now, we never talk about after-tax income. We talk about EBITDA, earnings, earnings mm-hmm. appreciating it, and interest in taxes, and that's a real trap because if you're a service company where your customers pay you an advance a year in advance for the service you're about to deliver, uh, EBITDA may be a pretty good measure of your cash flow. If you're a manufacturing business where you have to keep investing in plant and equipment and your customers pay you 90, 120 days after you deliver the service, that's a very different cash model. And it's very important to understand the, the difference between the two. And at the only thing, uh, at, at, at the basic business level, the only thing that matters is cash flow. It doesn't matter what your accounting uh, earnings are. It's are you generating positive cash flow at the end of the day? And can you service your debt or or whatever obligations you might have that are going to come due? Could, couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, again, this reminds me again. So uh, in the first tech bubble, I was a PM at Soros. And one of the things I brought to, to George's attention was, you know, the accounting at all these tech companies was was kind of laughable in terms of ad backs and adjustments. And, you know, I think, unfortunately, now sort of 25 years later, you've got similar stuff going on with a lot of private equity firms where, um, you know, there are a lot of adjustments being made. And um, I'm not entirely sure that some of the quoted figures are actually indicative of cash flow. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, I think value was created by cash flow. Uh, you know, it's nice to say, well, this is a great company. It's going to grow 20 percent a year and it should be valued at X. But you better make sure you understand the cash flow. Can it can it create that value uh, within the constraints of its own cash flow? Can it generate enough cash to to get there. If it's growing 20% a year and, and acquires more and more capital every year to finance that growth, that's a very different company than, than one that's self-financing as it, as it grows. It, totally. Uh, and, and as you stated, er, er, f- far more relevant in a world of sort of so, so for at five than so for at zero to one. 
Yes. I, I, another observation would be that, uh, as happens during all these bubbles, uh, particularly in this tech space, people suddenly start to think that, well, the way we should value this company is a multiple of its revenue. And I think particularly in this last bubble, people learn, uh, I, I think, much to their surprise and, and much to their pain that valuing a company that is growing very rapidly, that has great revenue, but is losing money, you can lose all your money doing that very easily. Or or have 75% down rounds. Yes. Yep. Yep. Agree. Um, all right. Well, we're we're towards the end, but um, and any, do you have a book you've read recently that you like or a favorite book? If If not, it's fine. Yeah, I, I just finished reading two very interesting books. I, I read uh, Walter Isaacson's uh, biography of Elon Musk, which was fascinating. I followed that up by reading uh, Mitt Romney's biography, which just came out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, w- I was just thinking about this today. You almost have two polar opposite people. Mm-hmm. Uh, Musk is, is an absolute genius. Uh, I tell everybody he is the Thomas Edison of our generation, he is a very difficult human being for a variety of reasons, some of which may be medical, but you know, very <laughs> complex, very difficult human being. Mitt Romney is one of the people that I truly admire, who is, is both an absolute first-class human being and is also a very smart, very successful person. But you have these two people that have, in their own ways, each has had a very big impact on, on our world. Um, and it just shows the complexity of life. Uh, so I, I love, yeah, I, I no, that, those books very, very interesting to read. I, I love the uh, comparative literature reference on the podcast. A, a, an unpleasant, a, 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 sorry, a pleasant surprise, unexpected pleasant surprise. Anyway, um, t- joking aside, um, no, no, that's great. Uh, um, yeah, and it's ironic you you mentioned Musk as the Thomas. Edison of our generation, because, of course, uh, Tesla is named after Nikola Tesla. And of course, Tesla and and Edison were, of course, um, had an interesting dynamic in relationship. So it's a we don't have time for obviously here, but it's uh, it's that's that's a super interesting story as well, as you probably know. It's also the thing that's so unique about Musk was that he created multiple successful companies, each of which was based on totally new technology. Uh, I mean, he is an absolute genius. Uh, on the other hand, he's probably somebody that you just soon not have dinner with. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, and 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 for example, he gets a lot of the credit for Tesla, but I know some of my smartest friends who are sort of machine learning experts, PhDs, quants. They all are blown away by SpaceX. They think that's where that that's yeah. just that the 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 reusable rocket and the machine learning techniques that they used to do that and to relaunch land those rockets and the like that's that's where it's impressive is my understanding actually but but anyway um uh okay any advice you have for other allocators or uh, investors I, I i have one piece of advice that i give to younger people which is give some thought today to what you're going to do when you become successful I, I think too many young people particularly in the investment business underestimate how much wealth they may create if they're successful. And they don't start thinking early enough about what do you want to do uh, with that success and, and with the wealth that you create. Uh, you know, I, I went through the, the same process myself of uh, you know, having, having come from not a lot of money, uh, creating a successful business, but always underestimating sort of how, how successful that, that might be. And it's 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 useful to begin to think earlier in life. Okay, if I create more wealth uh, than I can use for myself and my family, what am I going to do with it? Do I want to leave it to posterity? Do I want to give it away? Uh, do I want to take it to the racetrack and and uh, and gamble it away? Um, yeah, I, I think most successful people wait too long to think about what they're going to do with that success. Super good advice. I I couldn't agree more. Um, all right. Anything we didn't discuss that, that, that you were thinking might be interesting to talk about or that I should have asked you or you're discussing with I, others? I now? think we've pretty much covered everything. I'd, I'd say the one other topic that's very much on, on my mind is the political topic of we've gotten more and more bureaucratic in our government uh, functions. And I am worried about that. Uh, the, at the end of the day, the private sector is where the jobs are created uh, the entrepreneurial sector, uh, which is funded by the venture capitalists, 
and and to an extent also by the, by private equity people. That's where the real growth uh, and the future success of the economy is going to come from. And we just need to be careful as a society that we don't overregulate and make it too hard for the, the people in our society who are successful to be successful. So, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how relevant that is to everybody's investment perspective, but it's something to think about. And investing in heavily regulated industries is a much tougher way to make money than investing in parts of the economy that are less regulated. Yeah, well, unfortunately, I think that it's, I mean, I hate to say it's, it seems to me as though it's almost binary in terms of the direction regulation takes, I think will be a function of politically, which way we end up going. And I think it could be, yeah. No, you clearly have one party that's more regulatorily oriented than the other. Yeah, that's right. What happens? Yeah. All right. Well, look, Russ, on that note, look, I, you know, we'd like to thank you for the super interesting discussion, uh, sharing your most valuable asset with us, your time. Um, we hope listeners have a better appreciation for what, what one of the more thoughtful um, philanthropists, uh, investors, and foundation leaders is thinking about and, and how we may all benefit from this, um, particularly the advice on, on, you know, how one can use one's capital in a way to improve society. Uh, this is your host, Michael Oliver Weinberg, hoping you join us again for our next episode uh, where we speak with another thought leader who will provide insight into improving alpha via innovation. Thanks again, Russ. Thank you for listening to Improving Alpha Innovation in Investing ESG and in Technology, sponsored by Alternatives Watch and powered by Vidrio Financial. With Vidrio Financial Asset Managers, endowments and foundations, pensions, family offices, insurance plans, OCIOs, and sovereign wealth funds can cut through the complexity of asset allocation to reduce costs, mitigate portfolio risk, optimize compliance controls, and improve performance analytics. Interested to learn more? Contact us today at vidrio.com. That's V-I-D-R-I-O.com. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Vidrio Financial or our host, Michael Oliver Weinberg. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding investment planning.